All right, uh, we might as well get started. I'm Margot Atwell. I'm the director of publishing at Kickstarter and Drip. Before I got to Kickstarter, I was a publisher uh, at a small independent publishing company. And before that, uh, I worked at a literary agency briefly. Um, so I'm going to have all of my other panelists introduce themselves, talk a little bit about their writing and their background in publishing. Um, and I imagine that all of you have come here with a couple questions that you want to see answered. So I'm going to steal a panel format that Mary Rivenet Cowell told me about, um, where I have uh, you ask your questions before we do the panel so that I can make sure to cover those topics. All right, um, without further ado. Hello, my name is Mike Landerly. I've been in uh, the publishing business for about two and a half years. I've written about 30-something books myself. Uh, my company has over 220 out. We'll do about 16 releases this month. And we are, uh, or myself personally, I'm in the top 100 best-selling authors on Amazon. Uh, he's in the top 25. <laughs> I'm Jonathan Brazy. Um, I'm a retired Marine. A uh, full-time writer. I'm independently published with my novels. Um, I've got 55 titles out. Uh, started publishing in 2012 and really kicked in in 2014. So I have, don't sell as many as Michael, but I have some knowledge of independent publishing. Hi, I'm Kat Rambo. I am the current president of Stiff Farm. I, my writing, my, I don't have a whole bunch of novels. In fact, my second novel, comes out this Sunday. You can find it in the theater's room. Mm -hmm. But I do have 200 published uh, short stories. So I have a kind of odd backlist. And I have published most of those uh, traditionally, but I do have a certain amount of self-published stuff as well. So I am a hybrid author. Hi, I'm Dong Wan Song. Uh, I'm a literary agent with the Howard Moreheim Literary Agency. Uh, I've been an editor with Orbit, I've worked at other agencies, and uh, I've worked for an ebook startup. So I think I'm the voice of traditional publishing on this panel, is what I'm getting. All right, so before we dive in, uh, are there questions, specific questions from the audience that you want to make sure that we cover? In the blue? Okay. Um, other questions? In the green? Yeah. Oh, so the question was, how do you plan a backlist? What do you mean by that? <laughs> Sounds like there's some, some interest there. Uh, are there a couple other questions that people want to make sure that we cover? <laughs> Good question. Uh, one more question from the audience. Um, oh, in the front row. So that's not really, uh, is that a question about reprinting things that are not your own? No, that's fine. Um, gotcha, great. All right, so I think that this is a really great starting point. Um, 
Uh, at the end, uh, I'll see if there's more time for this, but we do have a lot of questions here and a couple more that I had written down. Um, so I think the first question that I would love to ask the group here is, how do you get the rights reverted in the first place? You've sold something, it's been published, maybe it's slowed down to a trickle, something like that. Um, how do you get those rights back? Um, so the primary thing you're gonna wanna look at is, um, it, it, it is, it's just gonna depend on your contract, right? So depending on the publisher you're working with, um, almost every contract, and this is something to really pay attention to when you're entering into a new agreement. It's one of the primary things you should be looking at is what the out of print and what the termination clauses are. So um, once, basically your contract will be active so long as the book is in print. How that is defined used to be a lot simpler before eBooks because when they stop printing books and they're no longer available on shelves, you are now out of print, you get your rights back. Um, it wasn't quite that simple, but it was close to. Um, now with POD technology and with eBooks, it's becoming harder and harder to specifically define what is out of print. The most common metric that we use is uh, a certain amount of revenue earned over a royalty period. Um, so if you are selling eBooks and you're selling POD, provided that they are still available, if you're earning under N dollars, sometimes it's $25, sometimes it's $200, something along those lines, then you can request to have your rights reverted to you. Um, the publisher off often has some options to then put the book back into print, to clear that threshold or not. Um, and that can be a little tricky depending on the publisher. Uh, publishers have a vested interest in hanging on to those rights and trying to exercise them. As an advocate for the author, I have a vested interest in making sure that those rights are being uh, exploited to the maximum potential possible. Um, and if the publisher can do that, great. Oftentimes, we're looking at other options. So has anyone on the panel ever gotten your rights reverted from a publisher? Uh, what did that look like? And then what did you do with those rights from there? Just in, oh, I'm actually uh, in kind of a kerfuffle right now because uh, that was not something covered in the contract for a collection. And so uh, kind of trying to sort that out right now. So one of the things that I want to say as SIPA president and as a fellow writer is please read your contracts and make sure that you see all of this in there and as Don says make sure that language is in there so if you have an agent presumably they are looking out for you for that one hopes one hopes I, I have a sh I have a story that's going to be reverting to me in July it was in the contract I knew it from the beginning and in July it comes back to me and it's going out I it's a short story I don't have a whole lot of short stories but I do put out short stories uh, on my self-publishing it's going out and it will go into my personal anthology and I think I have enough for that. So, but I know for a fact on July 14th, it's mine. Uh, Dawan, have you ever had a client get their rights reverted and then do something other than go back to traditional publishing with it? Um, not personally, uh, I joined the agency three years ago so most of my stuff is still pretty early in its life cycle. Um, you know, I, there are plenty of options for doing that. There are certain agencies that offer digital publishing services in addition to um, the other things that they do. And in part, that is to exercise. They tend to have a very large backlist. So one of the things they're trying to do is help their authors uh, make sure their content is available, make sure that, you know, it's being published well. Um, and, you know, there are some of those companies have grown to be larger publishers than that initial venture. Um, it, go, taking them indie is always a really good option for those. Um, it's a good way to uh, sort of maximize the long tail uh, benefit of being on digital retail services, basically. What is profitable for an individual author is often much, Not, yeah. Yeah, much easier to cross that threshold than for a, a corporation. Yeah. Um, I realize that actually I haven't talked or asked about what is a backlist? And perhaps that would have been a really good place to start. Um, can you talk about, for each of you, what is your backlist and how do you think about it? Um, what percentage of, of your earnings does it make up if you're willing to share that? I'm going to probably be one of the strangest ones up here because we produce, and this includes even myself at times, books on the scale of every four to five weeks. And so for us, a backlist item, we look very specifically, we are all Amazon, so we're gonna have a very data-centric focus related to this. So 
Typically, for me, a backlist is anything that's not the primary seller, the most recent item out. But imagine, if you will, when, for instance, we released book seven in my series today, and book one in that series was released two and a half months ago. So you, you have a three week between book six and book seven, but book six, by that definition, is now backlist, right? And so we also see that on Amazon, when you release books, there are uh, thresholds, uh, cliffs that we call them, right? So we can see from our data, 14 days is usually your biggest jump of income. And then it goes down at 18, 21, 28, 35. And then you're like, ah, shoot. And so just from Amazon supporting it, your backlist is, in my definition, typically 35 days. And then that book is out. And unless you're marketing it, it's going to slowly go down to oblivion until the next one, if you're series focused, which we are, if you're series focused, then book one is going to bring that back to life, and then one's going to bring two, and so on and so forth. So we look, really look at it from that perspective, and, and from a percentage of income, uh, we're a seven-figure business, um, and I would look at it as saying, backlist, or, or uh, let me take your theory and gambit, which we just brought out, book 21, and, and the close that series out in February. And um, it's going to be half a million this year, probably. As an indie, well, I could go with Michael's uh, how he how he defines it. But if you're if you're looking at something that's out of print, my backlist is a lot of nonfiction, and quite frankly, I'm working on only one of them to uh, get that. It's a esoteric book on the tuna industry, uh, and I just don't think I'm going to make a lot on it. But I just want to have it there <laughs> in print again. So that's the only book I'm working on right now, and I've, I've uh, contacted the, the publisher. They're going to give it back to me. It's not a problem. As far as fiction, the only, my backlist of, of stuff that was not in print anymore uh, goes back quite a, many, quite a few years. And uh, I contacted the magazine that published my first short story. It's no longer in publication, so I'm just kind of taking it. Uh, the other stuff I actually never published. I had some short stories I never published. I've put them all out this year. Um, all told, I doubt if I've made seven, eight hundred dollars on those, but they're independent. I sell them for 99 cents, and I consider them just making my net a little bit bigger to cast out to let people find me. So my backlist is primarily short stories, and so it's a kind of different deal in that I don't have to worry about reversion of rights, right? When I sell something to a magazine, I'm selling the first publication rights, and then I know that I have them. I think of each t short story as a tiny rental property, um, and I can do several things with them. I can you know, self-publish them. I can self-publish them individually on Amazon which I have not found particularly successful. Um, I can put them up in collections, which I've had, uh, I did a steampunk one that I think I've had some decent luck with. Um, but I also can sell them again to magazines that take reprints, so there's a third uh, avenue. But I, I, you know, if anybody here is a short story writer that is thinking they're going to support themselves through short <laughs> story writing, <laughs> let me disabuse you of that notion now. And, you know, I can speak to this topic a little bit from having worked for a big five publisher. Um, the publishers, traditional publishers publish in seasons primarily. There's usually three to four seasons. Um, anything basically not being published this year would be considered backlist. So anything that is not part of the current upcoming seasons. Um, those would be your front list, backlist, anything else. Uh, backlist can be a very, very profitable sector for a publisher. Uh, many, especially as we've seen all the consolidation that's happened over the past 30 years, that means a publisher often has a backlist in the tens and tens of thousands of titles. Um, and that can include everything from Dune to, you know, a, a romance author you've never heard of because they sold five copies. Um, and it can often be a very good idea to bring those back out into uh, a new edition, right? Put a new cover on it, new packaging, new marketing, uh, do a new launch for it. The thing to always keep in mind and the thing that um, has been true in my experience is no matter whether it's a front list title, whether it's a debut, whether it's 15th book in the series, if you're not publishing with focus and intention, and if you're not putting together a concrete plan about how you're going to reach an audience, and how you're going to have it stand out from all the other books that are coming out that month, 
front list or back list, then um, you're not going to find the success and you're not going to find the revenue that uh, you need to keep publishing that book and to support the, the venture as a whole. Um, publishing, positioning, and marketing, and all those things take a lot of um, strategy and planning and work. And that's as true, if not even more so, for backlist than for frontlist. To dovetail on what you were saying, um, when I was an editor at a publishing company, sometimes an author would come to me and ask if they could, um, ask if we would do a new edition. And sometimes if they made a convincing case for why we should, we would do that. So it was the same relationship and we would put a new cover on it or um, you know, do a new print run, um, republish it, resell it into the trades, and it could give an older book new life. Um, that worked very well with a book called I'm Dancing As Fast As I Can. We weren't the original publishers of it, but we bought uh, an imprint that had had the rights to it. We, we ended up meeting the author and she's like, yeah, I'd love to see it well published and out into the world. And after we repackaged it and republished it, it ended up hit, hitting the um, Wall Street Journal bestseller list, um, even though it was a 40-year-old book. So um, often, you don't have to get the rights reverted, and it doesn't have to be an adversarial relationship. If you go to your publisher and talk to them, especially like if you have a good agent that's advocating on your behalf or it's a smaller publisher, you can often get them to reinvest in that same property, either by doing a new edition or if you're if there's a reason that it's still marketable um, and that you're willing to do that work, they want to sell books too. So if you can go to them and make a good case, often they'll be willing to play ball with you. So um, I want to jump to uh, a question that we had from the audience and also um, uh, talk about what you were talking about, Kat. Um, how many times can you resell a reprint? As many times as, as you have energy to send it out. <laughs> How many times have you resold a reprint? Oh, um, I think my most reprinted story, which is uh, Magnificent Pigs, has been in maybe 20 or 30 places. Oh, wow. Yeah. But I also, I, you can sell them to foreign markets, and that's, that's, it's fun. That also makes no money whatsoever. But every once in a while, you get an anthology in Croatian with your name on it. Um, and I, to, to respond to that, um, one other way to take advantage of backlist is foreign rights, and probably Dong Wang can speak more about um, the pitfalls and the pleasures of foreign rights sales. <laughs> uh, yeah, foreign markets can be quite lucrative in a number of ways. Um, on an individual case, it's often quite a small fee for any given reprint, but um, you know, every now and, again, now and again, something will take off. Every now and again, you'll get a deal where they're offering royalties. Um, you know, I've heard of Brazilian deals that are in the five figures. Um, China's paying really good rates for uh, short fiction to translate these days. Um, that can also lead to a lot of film deals. Um, and, you know, optioning short stories is a very hot area right now. Um, we can all thank Ted Chang for that. Um, so, you know, it's something to keep in mind. Short fiction has a lot of the same benefits as, uh, you know, long form backlist as well. Um, the media environment we live in, people are desperate for content, um, you know, and whether that's right or wrong, or w there's a lot of reasons for that, but there's there's an incredibly high demand for new stories right now, um, and whether it's short fiction or long fiction, and um, your backlist can be a very rich territory for that. I mean, we're seeing major old franchises sell in the tens of millions of dollars to, to film studios right now. So, um, so long as you can keep attention on what you do and, and make a case that your audience exists, um, there's always potential to find new life for that franchise. And how do you do that? This is a question for all four of you. How do you make your older work new again or fresh again or find new audiences for it? So my first book, Death Becomes Her, came out in November of 2015, and about 45 days ago, we rebranded the first cover. Now, we had advertised that through probably well over a million impressions on Facebook and certainly in the three to four million impressions on Amazon itself. The belief was that we were ad exhausted. You know, people were exhausted of seeing it. They've already made a decision when they saw the cover of that book whether or not they cared to go any further. So about $750 later, we have a new cover. We put it back on. The ads for certainly on Amazon just... <laughs> And certain for the next few weeks, it was obvious that just that cover alone helped change people in coming back to it. 
I was going to say covers too. Uh, with my older work, uh, with my older works that are not making much, do a recover, uh, redo the blurb, uh, do a, uh, a Kindle. I mean, do an. Uh, these are all ebooks. Do a Kindle promotion with a countdown, and that tends to bring a little bit of life back in. And, and if this is, I have I have a one I have a military fiction series that keeps slowing down. It, it made pretty good money initially, but it keeps slowing down. But every time I go back to book one and do another uh, Kindle promotion, it bumps up again. So you you can't just let it sit there and founder because it's not going to miraculously rise like yeast bringing the, the, the cake, the, the bread up. You got to actually do something to goose it along. But I can't say that I, you know, when the difference between a hundred dollars a month and a thousand dollars a month, that's a pretty good difference for a month. It just doesn't sustain itself as well as bringing out the next book, which then goes and refreshes all the older stuff. One place where you may find a new market is with audio. I know that a lot of my stories, I end up selling audio reprints. And I actually, I think the only time one of my husband's friends has actually said, oh, Cat Rambo, it was because he was a podcast listener and had heard of this. Yeah, I mean, a new cover style, a new market. Um, in, in the traditional side, we call it positioning, right? Um, basically, in, in my view, the only real question in publishing, what everything boils down to is who is this for, right? Um, every other question is some derivative of that. So if you can answer that question in a new way, then that gives you an opportunity to sell more copies. Um, there's a lot of tactics to doing that. Coverage is one of the key ones. New copy, rewriting the description, writing a new blurb, getting new quotes for the book, um, just a new advertising strategy. You know, different channels, different look, different messaging, and you can find a whole new audience for it. Um, people have incredibly short memories online, and sometimes you just keep trying. Just because it didn't work once doesn't mean you know. Especially in the indie side, I feel like you have. Uh, lots of opportunities to rebrand something, recover it, repitch it to a different audience. And once it hits, it hits. If it doesn't hit, people don't notice what they don't see, right? They'll only remember when it succeeds. I'd like to add one other thing is if you have your books on Amazon and they're really petering out, uh, change your keywords. Mm -hmm. If you have a book that is a little bit cross, gen uh, cross uh, genre, and you are pushing it as sci-fi, but there's a little bit of romance in it or something, well, go look on the list of the Amazon keywords that it takes to get in a new category. Once you do that, you get a whole a whole new set of eyes are gonna be on that book. And you may be able to get people who are more interested in the romance side of the story rather than spaceships or whatever else. Also to clarify what I just said, don't ever lie about what your book is. <laughs> Don't just retitle it and be like, it's a new debut. Like you have to be, you have to be transparent about it. People have incredibly short memories. They also will find you out every time you lie. So um, And then you'll get a then will return the book. Exactly. They'll return it, you'll have one million one star reviews. So be honest and be transparent, but be creative. We had a, a individual that came in and, and showed a chart of what was going on in the last like hundred and twenty days. And they showed specifically what happened when they released a new book and their sales, and then what happened when they had a book bub. And for those of you who know, book bubs are incredibly hard to get. Should you get it, it's going to boost your sales. It's almost a given. And then they showed again another release. And it was interesting to see that the spike from the first book release, let's say it's 3x, then you had book bub at maybe 1.25x, and then the next release was another 3x. So in general, it's going to be new book release beats almost all marketing. I think that's a nice segue to uh, asking the question that we heard earlier. How do you plan a backlist? Um, are there best practices around series, genres, et cetera? Okay. Uh, for, for indie publishers, uh, indie authors. I'll take this a little bit. So when I first started, I just wanted to make sure I had five books up because when someone saw my author, I wanted them to see the five books. Now Amazon has changed that page, so take a look at it. 
as a whale reader, someone who reads at least 50 books a year, I wanted to see that they had a lot of the same series because if I find an author and I connect with their characters, I want to keep reading. So oftentimes I, you know, and this happened, you know, books, bookstores 20, 30, 40 years ago for me. If I went into a bookstore and I didn't see three titles on the shelf, I wouldn't read it. I'm not, I wasn't, wouldn't wait. And so everything that LMP, LMBPN is about is about getting our stories into the hands of whale readers. And so when you're asking me that and you asked about doing, you know, a second series, the only reason to go to a second series, in my opinion, and let me, let me preface this with my mountain, the one that I'm climbing, is fans want to reread my stories and I'm going to make money. That's it. I don't really care about giving away 60,000 copies. I'd rather sell 5,000. And so from that perspective, when a series takes off, I double down. And we go hard to give them the series that they want. Now, a lot of authors might be in a position that you might or might not be thinking about, which is, but how do I continue writing a story if I'm bored with it? Mm. You know, my, my mind says, yeah, this was fun in two books, but now I want to go write that story. That's more fun. If your mountain's not money, go for it. If your mountain is making an income from this and perhaps being able to either give up the day job or whatever else that it occurs, then perhaps stay the course, learn from your readers, interact with them, and they will give you the ideas that are fun to continue. Mm. Let me tell you, 21 books in something like 28 months, it's not simple. There were many times I was like, I, I don't want to do this. And yet I knew the course, I'm old enough, I was 48 or 49 at the time, as an avid reader, I knew what readers wanted, at least readers like myself, let me clarify that. And I just kept it, I, you, you make yourself go through that and then continue it and so we finished. Now, having said that, I have something, a small series of four books called The Apology, where I killed a major character in book nine, or pseudo killed him, I had a soap opera retort, not a good choice. And series are hard because you have what we call read through. And if you read through, I think, uh, maybe Don, do you know this? Is 63% between book one and book two for trad pub average for read through? In terms of pickup from going from book yeah, one to book two? Yeah, yeah. so people yeah. read book two. Does that uh, sound like the right number? I don't know that there's any industry wide standard on that. You know, I think it really depends on the series and the situation. I okay. think if we were seeing 63%, we would feel like this is a reasonably healthy series and we would keep Reason publishing. Okay, That's what I would say. Yeah. So I, I concur. Well, I've seen as little as 50% where I encourage the person is like, go back and fix book one. And then we see typically on what I would say healthy series, 73 to 78, 82%, book one to book two, but book two to book three is 90 plus. And I can tell you 90, 92, 96% read through because the people are invested in the series unless the, the author burns out and they just, they're just keep milking it. And readers know that. And so uh, book nine, however, I killed a major character. I didn't realize how loved that character was. I went down to 85%. I immediately went back to my fans and went, guess what, new series, <laughs> he's coming back. <laughs> And every time I had to write that book, I was like, God bless me, I don't wanna write this. But I had to do it. If I cared for those two things, happy fans, you know, the ones that wanted to throw their Kindle against the wall when I did that, and you know, making an income. And so I hope that answers a little bit of your question. For, for me, I do get bored. But what I've done, and I understand 100% of what Michael's saying, and my readers, keep telling me I want more, I want more, I want more of this. What I've done is write, I, I cannot write 23 books in one series. However, what I can do is 23 books in one universe, mm -hmm. which I've done. And there's always a connection. Um, the, my protagonist for the first series, he's such a hero, they put a big statue of him at, at the boot camp. So everybody who's going through boot camp who does do that, they pass by the statue of Rick Lysander. So that c gives a connection, and the universe is the same, so I'm not inventing new terminology and stuff, but it gives me a fresh view, and I could go, because one of the problems, I write military science fiction, and one of the problems is as you get more and more senior, like you got the colonel and the general, it gets a little boring, because they're not fighting. Well now, this gives me the chance to go back and get a private who's gonna have a lot of fun, or uh, uh, someone in a different, specialty, uh, whatever. 
So I keep with them. It, it helps with the backlist because it's all connected. My fans all like it, but it's fresher in my mind, and I have an easier time writing it. A short story kind of related to that. First time I ever heard Jonathan Brazy's voice was listening to a podcast in an, at Las Vegas airport. I didn't realize he lived there at the time. But, um, yeah, he was answering that exact same thing about how when someone gets so high up, they can't go do the fun stuff. And I was encountering a, a character who was doing exactly that. And I'm like, oh, my God, you could have told me this a year ago. It would have been really helpful. <laughs> That's, I have a world that I write in, uh, Tibet, and I guess I've got, like, both of the novels are set in that and two dozen short stories, and it's not the same characters. It's different pieces of the world, and I know that there's plenty uh, waiting. And I really love the idea of kind of connected worlds, and I know... For my readers that have read all of the Tibet stories, they love it when little glimmers from one story mm -hmm. shows up in another. They I, love that. Oh, God. They're just like, oh, you brought the pot king back. Yay. Yeah. Does it... The question is, do you still treat it as one series or connected series, or do you market it as in the same world? I, I market it in the same world. Uh, in my my U, my United Federation Marine Corps world, it's four series and two standalones, and it ha also has uh, two no two novelettes that have or uh, yeah novelettes I guess they are that have been quite lucrative, and one novelette that got a Nebula nomination, all in the same universe. I'm just going to say for Bella Forrest, if you study her, you'll see that she has one series, but if you actually look at the books themselves, they're actually different stories within that series. So she's taken uh, a tact that, you know, one through X is this set of characters, and then 12 through whatever, this set of characters. So that's one way to look at it. We have done it multiple different ways. So if you just look at, you know, Kirthir and Gambit, the whole universe, you'll see that we've broken it out amongst long series or massive different series ages where we have a post-apocalyptic group we have a fantasy group we have a you know forward sci-fi group we have a near-term basically contemporary paranormal in one traditional example you could look at terry pratchett where you know that's all one series and all the Discworld books there's five or six sub-series within that that um but nobody they're never named differently and, and you just happen to know this is a vimes book this is a witch's book or whatever it is um, so how do you deal with the branding, especially if you're an independent author uh, of different books in the world? Do you have, do you use the same font for your own name? Do you use the same font for the title? Do you name the world, et cetera? What are some ways to signal to author, uh, to readers that if they liked one book, they'll like the next? In the Cuthering Gambit, we have, um, in the ages, Age of Magic, we have something very similar to for those that remember the Forgotten Realms. We have a branding that looks like that. For the Age of Expansion, we have a little brand for that. We don't necessarily carry over um, like fonts for, for names, depending. So we do brand the individual series somewhat uniquely. But you will see this inside, I cannot speak to a Apple, but inside Amazon, you have a title, a subtitle, and then also a series. So the series might have something, but we've used that subtitle to carry the universe together. Mm -hmm. So Cuthier and Gambit. Now, I've also had some feedback when we did something else that said a person saw the Cuthierian Gambit universe and got scared because we had over 100 books in that universe already. And so, um, you know, we're, we're thinking whether or not we want to pull that universe, Cuthierian Gambit, out of the subtitle and place something more appropriate in there. And then, of course, if they love it, they're going to look in the back and see that there's a whole universe to discover. For me... My, this was supposed to be just a five book series and it kind of grew to 23. Well, not each individual series, but the universe did. And, well actually no, I forgot, I had 23 novels, not including the novelettes. Um, it's the United Federation Marine Corps. And I did that uh, for on, on purpose because it got you the Marine keyword. So I don't have to waste that keyword on Amazon and Marine brings you right to Space Marines. And then I could focus on, on the other stuff, aliens, if there's an alien or whatever. And so the, I, I have my subtitle as something to do with the United Federation Marine. You know, it might be uh, Women of the United Federation Marine Corps, which is a, a three-book spinoff, uh, uh, you know, 
whatever it is, it has those terms in it. The font is different for each series. The look is different uh, for each series. I have even different uh, artists for different series. But you have those keywords that makes people that let people understand that this is what it is. But then I do have people who said, wait a minute, when they bought my Fire Ant series or, or Integration, which just came out, um, they were like, oh, wow, I thought this was UFMC. It isn't, and that's why it's not in the, the title. I, I don't really know that I have much useful to say. I do, I mean, one of the things about writing in the same world is I can say to my readers, it's a Tabat story. Yeah. And they're, they're like, oh, I know Tabat stories. Or I can say, oh, it's a Serendib story. And they'd be like, oh, Serendib, I like that. So that's helpful. Um, branding's really, really important. Uh, and there's a number of factors that go into it. A lot of it is the visual look and style. Um, you can have, you know, one cover artist do all your books, whether it's across multiple series or not. Um, even just how your titles are structured, having a similar type sounding title. I mean, Sue Grafton is the most extreme example of this, of you know that's a series, it's super identifiable because it's the alphabet, right? Um, but most series publishing would have some kind of thing that tied those books together and, and a sense of when the reader hears it, they just know what series you're talking about. Um, you can have a visual look that ties multiple things together. So V.E. Schwab series, A Tor, is a very good example of the Vengeful books and the Darker Shades of Magic books are not connected in any way. They're for the same readership because they're fans of V.E. Schwab, so they all have that black, white, and red, very stark design look to them. Um, there's a very specific aesthetic that they managed to hit. You need a very good designer to partner with you on that if you want to build that look, but there's a, there's a lot of things in your toolkit that you can think about, um, whether it's keywords, whether it's using a certain sentence structure for your title. Um, you know, Kirsten White is a great example of somebody who has unusual sounding titles, so you always know, like, oh, that's in that series. Um, those are things you can think about. Uh, color schema, cover artist, font, type, the very text of the title, all are very important. I also add, I, I'm, for each of my series, at least my military series, um, I create a logo like the Marine Corps, like, like this right here, on top of my hat, but for each service. And so I have this designed, and that goes on either the spine or even on the front cover somewhere mm -hmm. for everyone in that universe. So everybody takes a look at that, and they see, oh, that's the UFMC, or that's the, uh, the Navy of Humankind, or, or whatever it is. They can recognize it because of the, uh, the logo. And since I'm making these logos up, I can use them however I want. All right, so let's talk genre. Does it ever make sense to write in multiple genres? And if you do write in multiple genres, how do you connect those? Should you use a pen name, et cetera? Like best practices for that. So my, my first series is multi-genre. And the way to market multi-genre is usually to have a, a cover that's relevant to one genre, and then get them to enjoy your story and then take them on. So when you look at the first books, you think perhaps that my Kirthir and Gambit are more paranormal, and halfway through book one, you find out it's an alien situation. I'm actually taking you on a sci-fi ride. And so a lot of people enjoy that because I've, I've mixed vampires and werewolves and science fiction and aliens and this and that and the other, and they, they get into it. So um, we have, amongst the Kirthir and Gambit alone, we have an age of fantasy. It's post-apocalyptic fantasy, so right there we've, we've mixed the genres, but we have contemporary paranormal, we have futuristic paranormal, we have apocalyptic, apocalyptic dystopian, and that's across this whole universe, and so it, it's core, but what you find consider, uh, um, consistent is the story. You find characters that you love, you find humorous anecdotes, you find things that makes you want to feel about those characters. There is a lot of talk about whether or not you should go cross genre. I have found that, for instance, I've done a new pen name, Michael Todd, related to and focused more on paranormal urban fantasy. So would I do things differently? Because if you look at Michael Anderley, you're going to see 200 books. You know, there's just too much going on now. And so there's a lot of different tactics we're looking at doing. Multiple pen names is one of them. And, but the, the question is, we don't, or at least I haven't hid that Michael Todd is Michael Anderley so that I don't have to try to go across here and answer fans as Michael Todd, answer fans as Michael Anderley, answer fans as Ted Jones. I hope there's no Ted Jones. Um, <laughs> you know, whatever the case is. So there are, I would have to have a specific 
question to be able to answer like, oh, I would probably do it that way. I love my work too much to put a pen name on it. Sorry, <laughs> ego driven, I, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I do, I have done different genres. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, it's all my military related genres that actually sell, but me that be that my werewolf of Marines, I, there's a big Marine theme going here, um, that sold pretty well, but that's paranormal. But it's paranormal military, real military. It's no different from my, my military fiction. It just happens to be that one of them got bit by a werewolf and that gives him some advantages as he fights all real battles. I mean, it's Afghanistan. Real battles in Afghanistan, Iraq, the, the Battle of Fallujah. So everything in it is very, very accurate to include the major units that are there. It just happens to be he's a werewolf. So I'm kind of cross genre, but there is that, that theme of all the books that have actually sold. <laughs> I do have some other books that are, have nothing to do with the military. Haven't done very much, but so there, there is still that connection, but that also gives me the chance to change keywords mm -hmm. to go from military fiction to science fiction or paranormal when you're talking about werewolves um, because it is both things. I'm with Jonathan. I am too ego-driven to write <laughs> under a different name. Um, I think of it as I write in a particular way. I write in a particular style. And I think if somebody likes one of my science fiction stories, there's probably a good chance they'll like one of the fantasy ones. I think it kind of goes down to what I was saying earlier about the fundamental question is who is this for? Um, in short fiction, the, the answer is often it's for the same readership because they're there for the voice and for the writer. When it comes to novels, when you're jumping from genre to genre, you're often rebuilding in the new genre that you're working in. Um, it, it's not always necessary to do a, a pen name. Sometimes it can help in terms of branding. It also means in publishing your previous sales history is very important. So mm -hmm. if you have a poor sales track in one genre, rebranding yourself with a new name when you switch genres can be very useful. Um, you know, one really good example from my experience is I published Daniel Abraham and James S. A. Corey at the same time. Uh, James A. C. Corey is two writers working together, half of which is Daniel Abraham. What we did was we launched The Dragon's Path, which was a new epic fantasy, and we launched Leviathan Wakes, the new science fiction, started the Expanse series at the same time. So we released an ebook edition that was styled on the old Ace Doubles, where you bought the ebook, you got both books. You got one very large file <laughs> with about 400,000 words in it. Um, but they give the opportunity that if you came for this fantasy, you'd get the science fiction. You came for the science fiction, you get the fantasy. Now that worked really well because we transferred Daniel's small but loyal readership for his fantasy work over to the science fiction series, which in my belief formed the core of what became the fan base of The Expanse, which has grown significantly since then. TV shows help with that. Um, so, you know, it's very possible to jump genres. Uh, Daniel had a very specific strategy for doing so. I think he ultimately at one point had four different pen names working in four different categories, um, some of which were extremely successful and some of which were not. Um, so it, it's something to keep in mind. If you're going to work in multiple genres, expect to do a lot of the groundwork you did the first time around. Again, if you're going to do a fantasy novel and you're big in science fiction, sometimes that transition will go easy. Most of the time, though, you're going to be finding your back of the debut level right, and really scrabbling to get those readers, scrabbling to get that attention and review coverage. So keep that in mind as you do that. Um, it can definitely pay off. One thing to keep in mind, and this is very different on the indie side than the traditional side, but we're very attentive to reader exhaustion, right? So if you're hitting the same brand three times in a year, asking them to pay 25 bucks for a book, it's just not gonna work out for you, right? So you can really only hit them once a season or so. So you have to be careful. So what you can do, that's a case where a pen name can be really useful if you're gonna launch a different series and do two series in one year, a YA series or an adult series, fantasy or science fiction, whatever it is, um, some brand differentiation can be useful and let you do more content in one year than you would traditionally be able to do if you're doing hardcover debut frontless releases. Michael and Jonathan, have you found that reader exhaustion is something that comes into play with your books? That's a very well, different Michael, uh, Twenty book. If you could see this right here, 20 books to 50K is a 24,000 number 
21, group 21 and a half. That Michael is one of the founders, and this is uh, this is a 180 mm -hmm. from the whole theory. So I'll let Michael talk. He's he's the founder of it. So. So when I I based everything on the fact that I'm a whale reader, someone who wants to read four or five books in a weekend. And so when I look at that, the question really always became, in my mind, why were the traditional publishers not giving me more books, right? Because I would not start a series. I just won't until there were three, because if I love that character, hell no am I going to wait a year. Not happening. Whoops, what's the version of cursing here? <laughs> 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 so, online <laughs> yeah really so that's one of the things that I really appreciated the fact that because as I could create my books and my stories the fans would give me feedback and then I would be working on the next one and if I came off of writing a book which I, which I often would and I would be exhausted I would be with the fans talking to them and they would help energize me until about book eight or nine in which case nothing helped <laughs> so at that point you know we put out like in the next we'll put out 12 books the, by the end of the month that's in our company, in what we're doing. We have a very rapid release schedule and we, are, we just keep growing that situation. Now, I understand that there are massive differences in what I can do as a digital focused individual versus a traditional published who has to get through warehouses and has to get to bookstores. It's just not the same. How, you know, print on demand, we're usually within a couple of days of our ebook. So that's one facet and we're able to sell those print on demand says $9.99, but I'll tell you, it's not a focus on income on those paperbacks because it's a marketing ploy. A small percentage of the whale readers don't want to go to the, they just don't want to wait. Therefore, they're not going to sit there and go get a paperback unless they want it so bad because they love the book and put it on the shelf. So our expense of doing paperbacks that we do right now is strictly for the fans. It's for the fa fact that they would like to put these on the shelf. They want these books quicker. I started supporting other authors because my fans would take a book that I, you know, it's put me five weeks and editors and just in time readers and everything else to get out. And two hours or, you know, late that night, they're like, where's the next one? And I'm like, go read Jonathan Brazy for <laughs> sake and leave me alone. So we're a we were able to grow from that perspective. And that's why in 2019, we're looking at trying to hit 400 books out. Uh, so we had a question on um, when does it make sense to publish a short story reprint collection? This really depends on what you want that reprint collection to accomplish. If you want it to accomplish money, mm, I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, I think that if you have a bunch of stories that are organized all around a central theme, uh, for example, I have a bunch that I put out as Altered America. They're all steampunk stories set in a particular landscape. If you have connected ones like that, that might do well. If it's a collection of unrelated short stories, boy, it's going to be tough. It's Actually, I was going to ask you a question. I was going to oh, yeah. jump into a chair and go, hey, can I ask a question? No, go, go ahead on. and say what you're saying in the night. So, you know, uh, when it comes to that, I work with a number of short fiction writers who have won a bunch of awards. They're very well regarded. Um, we haven't put any short story collections out for them, even though they have enough stories for that. Uh, releasing a collection is an extremely tactical question when it comes to traditional publishing. They're not known to sell very well. You're going to have a very tough time convincing the editor to spend the kind of money on it. That means it's going to get the marketing and support that they need to make sure they're getting a, a, a satisfying launch and they're going to sell enough copies. Um, if there's a media tie-in component, that can be very helpful. So if, they're, if one of those stories is licensed, um, you can sell it as a lead-up to doing a novel. So oftentimes when you do see a short story collection come out from... Uh, you know, a well-known short story writer that is tied to a deal where they've also sold the rights to the first novel. Um, and, you know, they just want the collection out, so they're saying to the publisher, part of the cost of doing this is you're going to do this collection for me, right? Um, yeah, it's not true if you're Kelly Link, but for a lot of people, that is true, right? Um, so it, it's, it's, it's very... The answer from my perspective is when you can convince a publisher they're going to make money on it, and publishers are very not convinced that they will make money on a short story <laughs> collection. Um, you know... There's always outliers. Carmen Marie Machado is a great example of somebody who's done an incredible job with a short story collection last year. 
Um, but Grey Wolf is a small nonprofit press, right? They're not a for-profit publisher. They're, an, they're a very literary publisher. So something to keep in mind. It's very hard to do. Um, and you know, you're really going to need some big, very large outside motivating force to get that publisher to be convinced that it's going to be worth their time. I wanted to say that you know when we do omnis, so we're looking at say four books in an arc. We'll typically plan our our books in twelve, twelve, right, and then break them up to three arcs of four. We'll do four of them one month after book four comes out, and what we'll see is that our omnis to what Dong was talking. Dong was talking. Dong. Dong Wan. Thank you, Dong Wan. Was talking about ah question. So was talking about a little bit earlier ago. We don't see that the fans who love single stories go to the omnis. They really don't. I mean, there's really no risk in it. You're gonna, in fact, you're gonna catch the fans who love Omnis only. So, from our perspective, we're in Kindle Unlimited. Error. Um, but I would, I would venture to say that most Omnis make less than one book in a day. That's in, that's in that collection. If that gives you anything. And then I wanted to ask, do you know the history of like science fiction? Either of you, the science fiction book club, uh, where they would get Omnis and they put them together. Oh my gosh, as a kid? Yeah. 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 Uh, so book club rights are one of the sub rights that are defined in a traditional contract. So what you would do is sub-license out the content to a book club um, who would then do a bind-up edition, um, usually printed much more cheaply than the publisher would on different stock. Um, and you know, it, it, was, it, it can be very lucrative. Um, it's a business that has not been doing very well over the past 10 years. Um, ebooks hit that very hard along with uh, most of the sort of lower price point elements of, of the traditional publishing market. So but to, to uh, go back on what you said a little bit earlier ago, even 20 years ago, Omnis didn't really make a lot of money. Uh, you know, omnibuses and box sets, they were very profitable and they were the primary way that publishers would leverage a successful backlist, right? So anytime you had a series that was doing well, once you got past, especially in the era of heavy series publishing, it was sort of urban fantasy, early 2000s kind of um, era of publishing, um, box sets and omnibus editions were very important. And even now you still see large omnibus editions, you know, um, I think they just did Sam Sykes' one and it's like this big, I don't know. Um, you know, it, it can be a very good way to capture a new audience, especially once, you know, you're sort of the ideal reader for this, right? Once you're to a, a break point in the arc, you can do one edition and capture new readership. Um, Max Gladstone's an author I work with, you know, he's six books into the craft series. It's unusual to have a series that's that long running right now. And, you know, we've just done a lot of work with doing backlist omnibuses and price promotions to get new readers on board as we launch new books in that series. Um, omnibuses often are very, pegged to a certain um, timing, you know, you want to make sure that they're coming out right as you're running into a, a big front list release, and that can really help boost your overall readership, get more attention for an author as you're going into a front list launch. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just throw this out. My single best-selling volume of all my work is a trilogy. Um, my second is a, is a single book, but the trilogy, I, it's, it's made over six figures, and for the single volume, and I don't know why. Everybody talks about how it's not supposed to work, but it sells far better than the three books that make it up. I think you mean enormous successful strategy, in part because on the traditional side, at least, an omnibus is often a de facto price promotion that is permanent. Um, you're, you're getting a discount, I mean, you get more content for it, but what you're also doing is selling at a higher price point, so it's higher royalties for the author, and a guaranteed sale of three books versus one. Um, so you mentioned box sets, and I actually see that people on Kickstarter will often pledge to a box set, or um, there's a strong completionist impulse on Kickstarter, so often um, when you bring a s edition of, uh, I'm sorry, the second edition of something, or the second book in a series, or the third book in a series, people will offer book one, or book one and two and three all together, um, and a lot of people will sort of up pledge to that level. So. Um, a lot of the rules of traditional publishing tend to be sort of turned on their head on Kickstarter. Like um, anthologies are one of the categories in publishing with the highest success rate, no. which, yeah, not true in traditional publishing. Not true at all. Um, so we did have a question about if you're thinking about starting a publishing venture, um, how do you make that happen? When you say publishing venture, do you mean a publishing company or? Uh, was that in the front row? Was that? Oh, I see. What Yeah. 
I, you know, I think this goes back to what I said earlier in this, in that whenever you're releasing a new title, um, even if it's been published before, you have to make sure you're doing it with the kind of focus and attention you'd bring to a front list title. What you want to make sure is you know who the audience is, you know how to reach them, and you know the strategies are going to work for you to do that. Um, your costs are going to be lower in terms of rights. Like, that's not going to be your main you know, line item, but art, marketing, and um, production are still going to be elements you need to deal with. Um, you know, there's a lot of resources for that these days for indie authors, um, but really the strategy and the planning is going to be where all the work's going to happen there. I would certainly take a look at it. Everything that was said it was totally appropriate. You know, if you can go with the existing branding, you might have a shot, but you know, the question is to have the individuals that are going to purchase it, have they seen it before? Would they recognize it? Would they value it today? Does it look like the genre that's selling right now? I had to discuss something with an author yesterday that was here, and she was asking me questions about her books uh, that she had in magical realism, but the reality is she needed them to be in cozy paranormal. And if you know the difference between the two, it's massive. You know, Cozy, Cozy Paranormal is a bunch of black outlined silhouettes, kind of cartoonish animation, and what she had <laughs> was not even close. So she had to kind of bite the bullet and realize she just wasted all that money. You know, but she needed to move to the appropriate one. Not only that, but it was a lot, much larger market. And so the encouragement that had been just explained to find out where did this person go, where do they fit now? You know, the readers now, the ones that are going to purchase this, if you have a backlist, I presume it's large. Otherwise, why do it? Or it, there's heavy value in doing this. Now, if it's if it's almost like a, a non-profit choice, it's a little bit different, right? Because you just want to get them out. And someone reached or talked to me yesterday about the fact that there's a backlist. They have the rights all in paper. So you have to go back through and digitize everything, get it all edited again, new covers. So there's some, some real clarifications of what that means from a cost perspective. And there's no guarantee that you're going to even make $1,000 back. So there, there is an issue related to just the monetiz you know, monetization of this. There's a dedicated fan base. I think I'm going to say what Margo was about to say. There's a dedicated fan base. Even if it's small, something like Kickstarter is going to be a much better option for you because then you can raise the funds up front, have a sense of pre-sales of what you're going to do, and then, you know... It, not to speak for the Kickstarter person, but you know, I think uh, there uh, is. Great. But total yeah. <laughs> you know, I think Kickstarter is very much for fans and enthusiasts, right? It's why you know you were saying that anthologies and box sets and things do so well there because you're really reaching an audience who's very committed in a way that your casual consumer just won't be. This is great. Everyone's doing my job for me. Love it. Um, in our last two minutes, uh, can you just let everyone know where they can find you online and if you have anything um, that they should be checking out? Uh, the easiest way to find me is I'm on Twitter a lot uh, under just at Dongwon, D-O-N-G-W-O-N. Uh, you can check out my website if you're looking to submit material. It's dongwonsong.com. Uh, I have a very large book launch coming up next Tuesday, Marco Shiro's Anger is a Gift. Uh, you should all check it out. It is a phenomenal YA that is um, about the power of protest to change our democracy. You can find me on Twitter and most social media as Cat Rambo. Uh, you can go to catrambo.com. If you wander into the bookstore, there is my brand new novel there. It comes out Sunday. You may find me in there stroking its cover <laughs> lovingly. Um, and I also have a new nonfiction book out in there called Moving from Idea to Finished Draft, which is about how to take an idea and do something with it. Yeah, you can find me on Facebook, and you can find me on at jonathanbrazy.com. And if you go into the bookstore, you can find some of my books there, too. Mine are the ones that don't show any covers <laughs> over by where they where you pay. Uh, but I've got, I think, 15. I think I've bought 15 books there. And free signings. <laughs> on Sunday. On Sunday. Oh, on Sunday. Um, you can find me on uh, easiest place that if you actually want to contact me is going to be either grab me through the Protected by the Damned or Kirthian Gambit Facebook groups. You know, I, I am there often. Uh, you can see things on KirthianBooks.com, L M B P N. That's London, Marce <laughs> London, Madrid, Pars Barcelona, Paris, New York.com. And so, uh, love to talk to you. If you have any questions, we'll stick around, or I'll stick around for a little while. Um, see you soon. Uh, I'm on Twitter as Margot Atwell, and uh, if you want to stay in touch, you can just stay in your seats because I'm going to be back here in 30 minutes talking ah. about 
um, ongoing funding models and subscription models. So thank you so much for coming out today. I really appreciate Great it. Bookmarks.